Two weeks after Starship Flight 10, SpaceX has finally revealed the truth about their metallic heat shield test. And just as many had predicted, the results were so poor that they don't even want to try it again. So, why exactly did it fail? And if metallic heat shields are no longer an option, what's the next step for SpaceX to make Starship fully reusable? Let's dive into it in today's episode of Alpha Tech. In the last century, after World War II ended, another fierce battle quickly began, the space race. The United States and the Soviet Union were locked in a contest of power, pouring resources into rocket research like never before. At NASA's peak, the agency had more than 36,000 employees and advanced to the point where it ultimately beat the Soviets to the moon. On July 20th, 1969, Apollo 11 successfully landed Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, making them the first humans to walk on the lunar surface. So, yes, the technology back then was groundbreaking. They achieved what many thought was impossible. And yet, there was still one thing they couldn't do, something that seemed simple in comparison. Building a rocket that could be reused not just once, but over and over again. Even after more than half a century of progress, this challenge remained unsolved, a puzzle that kept rocket engineers awake at night. As Elon Musk himself admitted, making a fully reusable orbital rocket of any design is one of the hardest engineering problems of all time, much, much harder than going to the moon, which is why it still hasn't been solved. And you know why? Because a reusable rocket isn't just about flying again. Every part has to survive multiple flights the body, the engines, the internal structure, and the heat shield, which is the real deal breaker. If that fails, all the other reusable parts are basically useless. That's exactly what SpaceX faced in Starship Flight 10. They tested a new metallic heat shield, hoping it could replace the ceramic tiles they've been using. But the data? Yeah, it was pretty disappointing. To give us a closer look at what went wrong, SpaceX's VP in charge of flight reliability and construction, William Gerstenmeier, presented the findings at the Glenn Space Technology Symposium, hosted by the American Astronautical Society in Cleveland. He explained that the test flight on August 26th had a few big goals. First, to fix issues with Starship's engines and fuel system, which had caused headaches on the previous three test flights. Then, the engineers really needed data on Starship's heat shield, the thousands of ceramic tiles covering the belly of the rocket as it re-enters the atmosphere. Everything went really well, Gerstenmeier said. He confirmed that most of the objectives for this flight were successfully met. The only hiccup? The metallic heat shield tile test. Basically, we were testing whether we could use non-ceramic tiles, so we put three metal tiles on each side of the rocket to see if they could handle the heat. They're easier to produce and more durable than ceramic tiles. But it turned out they just couldn't, Gerstenmeier explained. To see exactly why, let's take a look at the moment just before Ship 37 touched down in the Indian Ocean. Check it out, a large orange patch running along the 52-meter rocket's belly, right over the thousands of heat shield tiles. That's exactly the rust residue from the three metallic heat shield tiles they had installed. This rust first appeared as Ship 37 began re-entry at about 120 to 130 kilometers altitude. At that point, the vehicle started feeling increasing atmospheric drag, heating up the heat shield system. The metallic tiles could have been made from iron-based alloys, special stainless steels, or heat-resistant alloys like Inconel. Unlike stainless steel 304L, which resists corrosion thanks to a protective chromium oxide layer, these test tiles may have been designed with a higher iron content or thinner chromium protection, making them more prone to oxidation under extreme conditions. During re-entry, Starship was moving at Mach 25, around 25,000 kilometers per hour. Friction with the atmosphere compressed the air in front of the vehicle, generating plasma that reached 1,500 to 2,000 degrees Celsius. At such high temperatures, the chemical reaction between iron in the tiles and atmospheric oxygen, O2, plus atomic oxygen in the thermosphere plasma, accelerated exponentially, thousands of times faster than at room temperature. When metals oxidize under such extreme heat, the resulting rust layer expands differently from the base metal. That mismatch causes the oxide to crack and flake off. As temperatures shifted rapidly during re-entry, the brittle oxide layer broke down into fine powder, which didn't stick well to the tiles. The high-speed plasma flow then carried this loose rust powder along the hull. Combined with Starship's high angle of attack and the humid ocean air, it created the illusion of a reddish flow streaking down the rocket's body, 
almost as if the rust were melting into water. And just imagine, if only three metallic heat shield tiles were enough to stain half the rocket's belly bright orange, then covering the entire vehicle with thousands of them would lead to corrosion on a truly massive scale. That's why another attempt at a metallic heat shield seems almost impossible, unless SpaceX can find a completely different alloy that's more resistant. The truth is, metallic heat shields aren't even a new idea. NASA already experimented with them back in the 1970s, but they never made it past the lab. In many ways, SpaceX's experiment with metal tiles perfectly captures how the company developed Starship, testing bold concepts in real flight, learning it fast, and folding those lessons directly into the next iteration. And one thing is certain, this kind of trial and error approach won't just shape the future of SpaceX, it could very well influence the entire history of reusable rocketry. So, if the metallic heat shield can't meet SpaceX's goals, what's the backup plan to make Starship fully reusable? The clues actually come from Gerstenmaier himself. During a briefing, he pointed to a white patch near the top of Starship's heat shield. According to him, this was caused by heat leaking through the gaps between tiles, which then eroded the layer underneath, a heat shield material originally used on SpaceX's Dragon spacecraft. Technicians had even removed a few tiles near Starship's nose on purpose just to see how the vehicle would react. Basically, it's a white material that we placed on Dragon, and when it wears away, it leaves behind this white residue, Gerstenmaier explained. That tells us the heat was essentially sneaking into the gaps between tiles, working its way underneath, and eroding that secondary layer as well. So, we realize the tiles need to be sealed tighter. So, the first solution is that SpaceX will keep using ceramic tiles, but they'll have to fit them closer together leaving little to no space for plasma to slip through. Of course, that also means adding more tiles, which could weigh the ship down with several hundred extra kilos. Now, for the second solution. Near the top of the vehicle, right in the middle of that white patch, SpaceX engineers noticed some darker areas. These were spots where the ground crew had installed a brand new experimental material around and underneath the tiles. They called it crunch wrap. Think of it like a thin wrapping sheet placed around each tile. Then, instead of glue, the tiles are held in place mechanically by a robot that presses them in. As workers push the tiles down, this little layer of brittle wrap basically sits around the tile's edges, and once it's locked in, they trim off the excess on the surface. Using this crunch wrap, it seal the gaps between tiles without needing gap fillers. On the space shuttle, those fillers added complexity and sometimes even popped out during flight. This is exactly what we're going to try on Flight 11, Gerstemeyer explained. So, for Flight 11, SpaceX plans to cover the vehicle with an anti-rattle layer to see if it can improve how well the tiles seal and perform. From a materials science and rocket engineering perspective, SpaceX's crunch wrap approach to the heat shield looks like a clever upgrade. Instead of using complicated gap fillers like the Space Shuttle, this material wraps around each ceramic tile and locks them in place with a robot press, which makes the whole system simpler and more secure. But the fact that it's brittle raises some concerns. Re-entry is brutal. Temperatures soar past 1,600 degrees Celsius. The airframe is shaking under crazy aerodynamic pressure, and everything is expanding and contracting at once. Under those conditions, even a small crack or fracture in this wrap could compromise the shield. That's why SpaceX is also layering in an anti-rattle barrier, hoping it'll help keep things sealed up tight. Whether this material can actually survive the chaos of multiple re-entries is something only real-world testing will answer. That's what Flight 11 is all about. If it works, it could be a major leap forward. Beyond the heat shield story, SpaceX is also making big strides in another area. Very soon, they'll be launching a highly important science payload for NASA, the Interstellar Mapping and Acceleration Probe, or IMAP. The launch is currently scheduled for 7.32 a.m. Eastern Time on September 23rd from Launch Complex 39A at Cape Canaveral, Florida. But here's the thing. This mission isn't just about IMAP. On board the rocket will be several other spacecraft, turning it into a rideshare launch packed with scientific opportunity. Alongside IMAP, we'll see the SWFOL-1 Space Weather Monitoring Satellite, developed by NOAA, and NASA's own GeoCorona Observatory. Still, IMAP is the real centerpiece. This spacecraft is designed to open up an entirely new frontier in studying the boundary of our solar system. It will be the very first dedicated mission to map the outer edge of the heliosphere. 
a giant bubble created by the solar wind that shields our solar system from interstellar radiation. To pull this off, IMAP carries 10 state-of-the-art instruments, built in collaboration between U.S. institutions and 27 international partners. These instruments will measure solar wind particles, interstellar dust, and cosmic rays, while also keeping a constant watch on the sun's activity. All of these spacecraft are headed for the Earth-Sun, L1 point. That's a gravitationally stable spot in space, about 1.5 million kilometers from Earth toward the Sun. From this vantage point, IMAP and its companions will have an unobstructed view of solar activity. More importantly, they'll be able to provide advance warnings anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour of incoming solar radiation storms. That's a big deal because these storms pose serious risks to astronauts once they leave Earth's protective magnetic field. NASA has made it clear why this mission matters. With the Artemis program preparing to send astronauts back to the moon, Artemis II orbiting in 2026 and Artemis III attempting the first lunar landing since Apollo in 2027, the danger from space radiation becomes far greater. The ability to forecast solar events could mean the difference between safety and disaster. Nikki Fox, NASA's Associate Administrator for Science, explained that IMAP will deliver faster, more accurate warnings than ever before, directly supporting Artemis II and III. But IMAP isn't just about protection, it's also about discovery. Principal investigator David McComas emphasized that IMAP's data will deepen our understanding of the heliosphere, how it shields Earth and the solar system from cosmic rays. This research could reshape not only the future of exploration, but also our fundamental knowledge of how solar systems evolve. Flying alongside IMAP, NOAA's SWFOL-1 satellite will also play a critical role. This spacecraft is dedicated to real-time space weather monitoring, keeping constant watch on solar energetic particles, and feeding that data directly into NOAA's forecasting models. That information is essential for protecting satellites, communication networks, and even power grids here on Earth from the effects of geomagnetic storms. All in all, with these breakthroughs, not just in spacecraft, but also in the growing partnerships between NASA, SpaceX, and other agencies, the future of space exploration looks brighter than ever.